by opera singer Effie Norman. Um, Norman, who passed away in 2019 and left behind an incredible artistry and um, educational programs, was reluctant to be categorized into one voice pitch. She eventually was given the operatic title of a dramatic soprano. Her voice ranged dramatically, not only in pitch, but also in the emotions and tones she expressed. Here in the following, you'll see a small video excerpt of her rehearsal of Carmen in 1989. Mm -hmm. No problem. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, the range I think in this excerpt is just so incredible, which is why I selected it to kind of highlight um, what she was known for there. And um, the range of works and genres uh, covered on the compilation album Between Love and Laws. Uh, spanning from dramatic opera arias to uplifting spirituals gave me inspiration to show works of different tones, mediums, and work phases together. The images that you see circulating here in the background show the individual works um, in the exhibition and some installation images mixed in. In the year following the start of the pandemic and the so-called racial reckoning and leading up to the birth of my first child, the idea of compiling works of different tones resonated with me, particularly love and loss marking the two ends of the spectrum. I appreciate that the title love and loss between love and loss addresses a range rather than a combination or an opposition of feelings. And another factor for the selection of works for the show, aside from tone, was how my works relate to the body in movement, hence um, the assigned reading that Stan mentioned. Except two video pieces, all works in the show were still, but they related to imagined movement and physical interactions in different ways. Dance and movement have consistently been a strong source of inspiration for my work. I am especially interested in how movement expresses social and psychological concepts and how movement translates those concepts into nonverbal language through gesture and embodiment. And this is also why I suggested the video of Storyboard P, who I believe is a really great movement artist um, especially when looking at gesture and embodiment. And he also has a very interesting relationship to choreography, but we could talk about that later. Through my work, I think about relations and relationships. The works often start with the title, and I'm particularly interested in those relations that exist on an interpersonal and even an intimate level and translate relevantly to a structural and a political level. For the show, I selected works made over the past eight years, including works on paper, sculpture, and video. And in the following, I will give you a walkthrough of the individual works in the exhibition. And I'll do my best at describing what you're looking at, but if the scale or even the shape of something you're looking at does not make sense, then please feel free to interrupt me.
The first work I would like to discuss is titled Drainer 2 from 2021, consisting of ceramic, steel cable, limestone, and aluminum. What you see is a cast of a partial abdomen folded over, suspended from the ceiling, hanging slightly above eye level over a stone basin with a large metal drain at its center. I got inspiration for the piece when I was doing a residency in Salvador, Brazil and was introduced to aerosilk acrobatics. The instructor Douglas Rodriguez here is showing some of the basic poses. I was really struck by the second pose and made a sketch of my association with it. The hanging folded body to me looked like dramatic surrender and reminded me of an image of an animal in a slaughterhouse being drained of its last drop of blood. Here the sculpture functions as an apparatus of capture of a movement that gets frozen into an image. The glossy drippy inside of the cast is intended to resemble bodily fluids. The outside shows marks and wrinkles, symbols for a history of experiences left on the body. The sculpture to me resembles a gesture of fatigue, a fatigue that can be experienced both mentally and politically the fatigue that I see present in the context of Afro-pessimism and urgent calls to radical self-care. The large drain represents an aspect of industrial waste culture and denial of value. The next piece I'd like to discuss is titled Destabilizer from 2018 and then revisited in 2021, consisting of ceramic and stainless steel and metal hardware. You're looking at foot, at foot soles split in the middle and hinged to metal rods. I made the first version of this piece in 2018 when I was thinking about the feeling of being destabilized. It was a moment where I thought about the lack of objectivity in interpersonal conflict, but also and especially in the climate of fake news. During the Trump era, fake news were used as a propaganda tool and the objectivity of facts was questioned and destabilized. The metaphor of an unstable, broken ground came to mind and led me to this object. I was thinking of stability as something objective, like a ground or truth. And at the same time, I was thinking of stability as something that cannot be taken for granted, that has to be held together and that can shift. In this sculpture, it translates stability as a construct rather than a given. A similar sensation of an unstable ground led me to this video, Burdened, from 2018 as well. It's a 57 second loop without sound.
There are three sequences, uh, one showing a foot ground relationship, the second showing a body making increasingly harder steps, and the third showing an accumulation um, of clay chunks. The feet are shown on a muddy ground. The steps gradually start to stomp more as the mud becomes thicker. Clay is here used as a demonstrational material, symbolizing an accumulation of weight. The weight is also represented by the shaking of the camera frame. The body is shown without arms, gesturing at a weight that is carried above the head. The loop ends with the body falling forward, leaving open whether it catches itself. And finally, another foot groundwork, this time a monoprint on paper titled Dance Marks from 2014, relief ink on paper. For this piece, I taped down a sheet of aluminum on my studio floor and spread some coarse sand over it. I then left dance marks on it. I inked up the aluminum sheet like a regular intaglio plate, meaning ink was rubbed into the grooves left by scratches of the sand and printed it. What struck me about the result is that there are two apparent clusters, left and right. With the title dance marks in mind, I was interested in leaving the question open whether two bodies or one have left traces behind. This idea of interaction with the self was also present in the making of this video, Fingers from 2013. This is one of the first works I made when coming to grad school and it was made with a very playful approach, not really knowing what I was doing yet. Seeing the direction in which my work developed, it seemed relevant to show it in the context of this exhibition. The fingers oscillate as opponents and as partners, sometimes acting as a unit and at times in disharmony. This leads me to a recent sculpture, Negotiator Number no. 2 from 2021, consisting of ceramic, stainless steel, and marble. After a conversation about the work, Bo Rutland, one of the directors of the gallery wrote, and I could have not put my thoughts into better words. The act of negotiation is made public in this work. A large stainless steel wheel with levers for two participants. Ceramic hand grips mark each party's placement. Yet the wheel has a diminished range of motion in acknowledgement of the inherent limits of such discussions. The weight of the structure bears down on delicate ceramic spokes coated in a corporal glaze, its tracery of red veins highlighting the emotional vulnerability of any negotiation, a process in which one's needs, desires, and hopes are laid bare. Negotiator stems from the artist's personal experiences, advocating for herself in institutional settings, which are evoked by the marble base. And what I could add is that the wheel actually rotates as the functional integrity is important in my work and leads to the aesthetics that the work has. To say it in the words of Andre Lepecki, an apparatus, a mechanism that simultaneously distributes and organizes. This apparatus would only be functional if both parties used it completely non-forcefully as the ceramic spokes make the functionality extremely fragile and the fork prohibits a turning past 180 degrees for each of the opposing parties. 
So the fork is almost like a mechanical joke that limits the ranges, the range of the turning wheel. This brings up questions about horizontal power dynamics and hierarchy. This apparatus almost suggests that both parties have to operate under equal law and equal conditions, which is rarely the case in negotiation. The interest in mechanical metaphors was also apparent in a series of drawings, connection studies from 2015, graphite on paper. Each paper measures approximately postcard size that you see here in the install shot. All four drawings show physical elements held together through different joining strategies, insertion, caption, knotting, and penetration. These connections seemed quite metaphorical to me and brought up associations with relationships. Insertion on the top left as heteronormative, caption on the top right as all encompassing and possessive. Nodding on the low left as equal, reciprocal, and codependent, and penetration on the low right as intrusive and transgressive. The interest in two elements coming together, relating and connecting, is staged here also in my fairly recent sculpture, Mediator 2 from 2021. The sculpture consists of ceramic, stainless steel, and nylon hardware. I approach this work with a redemptive reconciling tone in mind. The sculpture consists of two chest collarbone casts and a cast of a microphone mesh at the center. The piece describes a relationship including a third, a middle person. The mediating position is mimicked here as a gesture of standing between two opponents held apart at the chest by two arm lengths, the horizontal rods. This position of the mediator is represented by the ceramic cast of a microphone. And I should note that I have used functional microphones in my work before, but for the sculpture, I wanted to highlight the symbolic value of the microphone by showing a ceramic cast of the mesh. And the mesh structure also resembles the surface of a speaker and functions as a symbol for the absorption and amplification of information, two qualities that are needed in a successful mediation. The two chest casts are slightly angled towards one another as if leaning into a confrontation. The casts show a difference in complexion and symbolize different subjectivities. While the sculpture can easily be read as a dialogue between a black subject and a white subject, I try to confront viewers with the notion of skin complexion that goes beyond race and ethnicity. The notion of colorism accounts for the complexities and power dynamics embedded in our skin tone and how our complexion can affect our identity and subjectivity. Overall, my intention was to represent difference and a dialogue that happens with the third party involved. Again, here the sculpture functions as an apparatus, a mechanism that simultaneously distributes and organizes. The round base is a reference to the movement of two opponents about to start a confrontation and rotating around each other and around a shared center. Finally, my most recent works have arrived at an interest in internal relationships, the relationship with the self looking inward. Purifier one and two from 2021, consisting of ceramic and stainless steel. There's still an implication of an other, an interacting agent represented by the cast of a mouth. 
In this sketch, it is shown how the device is intended to attach to the body. And it is ambivalent who is holding the device. The handle could be held by the body whose forehead rests inside the shield, while it could also be held by an other. The holes at each side of the funnel symbolize a connection between the two entities. Again, the ambivalence intended. The mouth represents the second body or an imagined other. My interest in spiritual practices, particularly Vedantic thought, which is the philosophical aspect of Hinduism, has led me to physically represent a divine or a metaphysical dimension. Those who are familiar with yoga or Indian spiritual practices might know the idea and location of the third eye or the mind's or inner eye. It's a concept of an additional an invisible eye, often when depicted located at the forehead, providing perception and insight beyond visual sight. This concept led to the shape of this object with a connection to a spiritual dimension or presence at the forehead. And that's it for this exhibition. And I'm here giving you a little preview of work that is in progress. Um, with my interest in spiritual practices and in movement, I'm currently looking at the concept of bowing, the body's movement in bending forward. If done sincerely, the ultimate gesture of humility, lowering one's head and one's ego. And here are some detail shots of the sculpture, which is still in progress. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I could just leave um, these images rotating in the background, but I'm also happy to just um, get out of the screen share. What, what is preferred? Or Kram, may I ask you what makes sense in this context? Um, I can put you on. You can see All your... Right. You, okay. You can see and your if, audience, correct. I can see the audience, which is very nice. Okay, so now we have it like 50-50, so I think that works. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Great. So she can hear you guys. So maybe I'll start. Um, looking at your work, I was often brought to mind uh, the, the form of Richard, Witch's Bridal, um, kind of a, an, an apparatus of restraint. Um, it seems like I mean, often the combination of these very hard materials, uh, very stiff materials, uh, with the more pliable human body uh, seem to have the influence of violence. Is that um, something you're, you've got in mind? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that, that you see the violence in the two materials coming together, or I should rather say the imagined material of the human body with the um, ceramics and metal. I think, you know, how violence comes into play is also that the sculptures look functional and they look like apparatuses or tools and obviously they suggest the use on the human body. However, because the fragility of ceramics um, is so delicate, you know, the, the pieces would snap. So I think um, maybe they evoke an imaginary interaction that could be violent. Some of the pieces do, um, but at the same time, they kind of deny it just by their fragility. And I think especially in my older works, there is more um, 
violence kind of dominating the read. And in this particular exhibition, I was really trying to avoid it. I think the most violent piece is Drainer. Um, you know, just this gesture of a folded body suspended over a drain, I think is, is quite violent. So it's kind of fascinating about the piece called Fingers. It seems like um, that could almost be a feature length um, choreograph choreographed piece uh, somehow. Chris, know how long that was. And I'm so glad that you're saying that because I thought, oh gosh, I don't want to play it too long. I don't want to bore people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you kind of like even like dramatic arc with with that. If you, you know, treat it like, like a piece of choreography, um, how long is that? You know, it's such a good question. I think it's one of the first pieces I made in grad school, and um, you know, I approach video very experimentally, meaning I don't have the, the full skill set really to handle it well. And I think the loop is super short. It's probably below a minute or just above a minute. And the way why, the reason why it looks so seamless is because this movement, I'm on camera right now, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this, this movement, you can just so easily reverse it. So that's what I did. It just like reaches a point where the fingers, like let's say they lean left and then it just goes back. And it's a good question how quickly the viewer would pick up on that because it's so random and improvised. I have a question. I don't think you can see me, but um, hi. Um, Not really. <laughs> you can't see me, yeah, but um, I'll just talk loud. I don't know why I'm talking extra loud. Um, <laughs> um, anyway. Um, um, I was interested in Stan's question about the violence perceived. I, in a lot of your works, there's you know negotiation. There's kind of a maybe a conflict, or like you said, two bodies coming to, coming together and negotiating or confronting each other. Um, and I'm very interested in this um, direction you've gone inside into a spiritual realm. Um, and I'm wondering if um, negotiation, conflict, um, these kinds of um, yeah, these kinds of conflicts with the other is still a part of this journey or how you've kind of grown to turn internal and spiritual um, as a focus of your work. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the two pieces, Negotiator, the Wheel, and Mediator, the two chess casts, I already made with the intention of wanting to lean towards a more redemptive and reconciling tone because as I mentioned, older pieces had a much more violent read. And the titles also reflected that, you know, something like penetrator or a border or objectifier, um, extruder, there were a lot of intruder, there were lots of kind of violent evoking titles. And um, my interest and maybe life approach um, really shifted and I wanted to look at more um, redemptive and reconciling relationships. And that led me to making pieces like Negotiator and Mediator where potentially it's a conflict resolution. It's also a confrontation, but maybe a more productive one. And also I should say um, confrontations with less of a do or done to dynamic. Um, and it's, I appreciate the question, kind of how that led to this interest in um, spirituality or spiritual practices. I think, um, you know, thinking about conflict resolution and how conflicts can productively be resolved, um, I certainly was, um, I certainly became aware of the role of um, the relationship one has with itself. It's really kind of weird to talk about this, but, um, you know, I can't help but think about, you know, parts of the world that are in conflict and, you know, someone, some, some, an example like Russia and Ukraine and, um, you know, a potential slow turning of the situation. And it's, it's so, 
um, obscure to us as quote unquote viewers um, of that conflict, why and how all of a sudden, you know, um, the Russian side is uh, considering certain options as a resolution. And I think really on a political and structural level, that is an example of, of the, the conversation with the self, the conversation that um, happens uh, unilaterally and then can be brought to the table again with the opposing party. I'm making quite a stretch, I'm aware, but um, I really do think about conflict always on the personal level and then how it translates to a larger structural level. Thank you. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you can talk about, can you hear me well? Yeah, very well. I was wondering if you can talk about this, um, your relationship to choreography, because I, I can imagine that when, when you when you sketched, um, you know, these ergonomic sculptures, like you must imagine or even maybe rehearse or practice movement a lot to understand how you want these these objects to, uh, to, to you know, like to to exist in relation to uh, to the body, and and then there is this gesture where, as Stan said, like you kind of like. Ex, like you get rid of the body or you you keep this imagined body and I was wondering like what is the moment where you find it more rewarding to um, to turn these these gestures into um, into uh, the form of sculpture that makes that there is something that is gained or maybe lost but in any way that you that that is a solution that you prefer to uh, to work with the body itself and maybe like at the risk of turning these objects into props. Yeah. Um, well, just to address the very last part of your question first, turning the objects into props, I once tried to enact um, a sculpture of mine. And to my eye, it was disappointing because I thought that the piece um, was finished like a sentence that ended too early. What, what I appreciate about the absence of the body is that viewers can kind of project what they imagine into those negative spaces that are left in the casts and kind of complete the sculptures in their heads. That's always what I'm hoping for. Um, but to address the, the first part of your question, the how, how I make the decision whether or not to erase the body or if I understand you correctly, when to um, turn to video, um, I think the most intense imagery, the most charged imagery, um, I prefer to represent in sculpture because I don't have to show a body and because there's a certain anonymity um, and you know, I'm, I'm careful to say universality, but I just put it out there um, about not, not showing a full body, right? If I say folded over abdomen, then I think the chances are higher that a lot of viewers can project um, lots of different imagined bodies into that cast. And if I actually show a body, then it becomes quite specific to that identity. And, you know, speaking about that universality, I wanna say that obviously, you know, these body casts are not representing any universality. It's always taken from my own body, which by the way, is not supposed to be the self portrait per se. It's much more the hope that if my work is shown um, as a, concert in concert with with each other the works that it reads more like body in general rather than if i you know use the body of one friend and then of another and of a really large body and a really short body then i think it really becomes like um uh portraits of these people um so yeah it's it's a kind of it's a refusal to represent one particular identity um, and also the hope that viewers complete the work 
in their own minds. That that's what's so attractive to me about the absence of the body. And it's it's difficult for me to answer when I turn to showing the body. I should note that you know in all my video pieces the body is always so uh, quite fragmented. Um, so there's still this kind of refusal of making it about one particular body. Um, but I do have this ongoing conversation with movement and dance, and I think sometimes. I can't resist um, but to try it out myself. But then I, I will admit that I usually return to sculpture. Thank you. So in relationship to, is that you in the performance work, the, the body with the clay and the feet? Is that all you? Yeah, I, I try not to make it important, but I also won't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> um, just experientially is there a difference for you in terms of your relationship to that work or how you view that work or have like embodied or experienced your aim in when you physically enact it versus when you sculpturally um, create it yeah very much so actually um yeah i mean with sculpture i can I can edit, you know, and um, I think the editing, the, the most significant part of the editing is actually the cut, like how, how a cast, like where a cast ends, um, what the exact shape of it will be. This is really a moment when I almost feel like I'm in a conversation with fashion, um, like where a shoulder can end and which curve that leads into. And um, it's a great moment in sculpting because it really allows me to abstract things. I remember I once made a sculpture of a butt cast and it just, those two like round ovals, it just looked so um, obscene to me. <laughs> and I remember, I remember kind of adding two, two curves to it that really abstracted the butt into something much more ambiguous um, and that is something that I cannot do in video when when I'm physically enacting something through movement um, which kind of adds maybe a layer of embarrassment or shame um, but also uh, you know it's a challenge of seeking out a different dial for um, coming up with nuance yeah thank you Uh, for dance marks, what dance were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, improvisational. It was just kind of dancing by myself. I think there were quite some spins, um, but it was mostly just, um, yeah, within that square. Dancing at that time, I'm sure it was to house music. <laughs> yeah. I had a heavy house music phase. Um, I was also wondering if you could revisit the four drawings that it's sure. By revisit, you mean like going back there? Yeah. Sure. I was wondering if you could explain the relationship between the sort of four different ideas you listed. I could explain the relationship. You called the first drawing heteronormativity. Right. You want me to just kind of expand a little bit on, on my associations? Yeah. Because that's all it was. It was associations that I um, kind of, yeah, spelled out. So what I found really interesting, English is my second language, I should mention, and my first language is German. And when I got into, you know, these tools and apparatuses, especially um, the ones with metal structure that already happened in grad school, and I started ordering um, the connections, it really struck me that um, they're called female and male. Um, and that, I think that was kind of the, the point when I realized like, wow, 
so many connections are considered male and female connections. And that's how that association of heteronormativity came up for the drawing on the top left. And then the drawing on the top right, um, my association was, I call it caption, that kind of connection. And my association was that it's, in order for it to be a safe connection, it has to be all encompassing and kind of possessive. Um, I'm not sure if I have anything to add to that, honestly. It's just, you know, my, my projection onto that. And then nodding, I mean, there are many ways to nod. And this particular nod um, in well, the German translation would be, it's called a cross knot. Um, I'm from Hamburg, which is a total sailor town. So <laughs> oddly, oddly in school, we learned quite some nodding techniques. And um, this particular one I associated with, um, you know, equality is very equal and symmetrical and reciprocal, but also very codependent. It's like the tighter it gets on one side, the tighter it will get on the other. Um, and it's extremely, sturdy. And then the one on the right penetration um, on the low right, I associated with intrusive and transgressive. And I should note that during that time, I was really interested in um, penetration as a, um, an abstract concept viewed through a psychoanalytic lens. So um, there's actually a really great reading that I'm happy to circulate for anyone interested um, by Diane Elise, I believe it's written in the early 2000s, um, called um, Unlawful Entry. And then the subtitle is Male Fears for, of Psychic Penetration. And it's, you know, like psychoanalysis, very often about like, you know, sexual, intercourse associations, male and female, you know, it's very, it's a very cis, cisgender discourse and all of that, but it's also extremely metaphorical. And that was the part that I was so interested in and in kind of this idea of the outer and the inner space and who regulates the law of that transgression and so forth. Um, and I can also say about that drawing that, um, so you see the penetrator going through some kind of plane. And then on the left, do, do you see my cursor by the way? Yes. Yeah, so right here, um, there is a kind of residue that to me really mimics something, again, to Stan's point, um, uh, something potentially violent. And I actually started paying attention to this um, residue of penetration, um, when, when I'm punctuating clay, because I have to account for the holes of the sculptures that basically, you know, hold together the apparatuses, again, female male connections. I have to account for these holes already in the making process because the, the material doesn't like to be punctuated after firing or it's very risky to do so. So I kind of drill into wet clay and um, that residue started to interest me. But did you have any other questions about, about those drawings that I didn't address? Uh, no, that was great. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I guess I have a follow-up question. <laughs> um, you said that uh, the functional integrity is I think you said essential to your work or at least important yeah. to your work. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, I guess why? <laughs> <laughs> Particularly yeah. if so much of, um, as you were just talking about how the body is absent. So we right. don't have to see these things performed. Right. I can really tell you why very easily because it leads to the aesthetics that the work has. So, let me maybe, sorry, I hope this doesn't make you dizzy. I can only imagine this on a big projection screen. <laughs> um, you know, on a detail like this, um, 
You see that tension washer right here? It's yeah. basically a washer with little teeth that that, that holds the, the wheel um, in place because easily, you know, it could otherwise just, you know, fall um, towards whatever is the heavier end of these handles. And I think this is a really good example why the works have to be functional because they end up requiring hardware and kind of mechanical engineering that I wouldn't think of if they didn't have to be functional. Does that make sense? Like if it didn't have to be functional, this would just be like one bolt. It also wouldn't have to have like tension, tension holes here on this nut. And then this kind of center hub would probably look a lot simpler. And I realized that early on um, when I was making the work, the work in the beginning ha only had to be functional um, to the degree that I had this rule in grad school, everything has to fit under my bed, underneath my bed, because I was really anxious of not being able to store my sculptures. And that's kind of how that whole language of mechanical connections and you know, telescoping was always a big thing in my work. Um, how that started. But then I realized like the more I make the work actually functional, like on a theoretical, but also like practical level, if, if the body were to be very careful, it leads to more interesting aesthetics. Um, but then there is a cutting off point, for example, totally. the drain I assume does not actually hook up to a sewer system, for example. Exactly, exactly. And that's because, so the cutting off point is basically where the aesthetics also, where um, you no longer benefit from the functional integrity because you don't see it, right? I mean, hooking it up to a sewer system would only be interesting if then there was water involved and you would hear um, something being hooked up. So if you can't experience the functionality um, visually, I think that's kind of the cutting off point. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about the decision to, to then make the microphone non-functional? Sort of like in that. Yeah. Let me try and also go to that work. Yeah, right here. So it was really important to me that um, the microphone was a strong symbol, much more than a device. And, you know, if I were to make another version, I might use a glaze that um, has a stronger distinction from the stainless steel. I mean, this is not the same silver tone, this palladium glaze, but still it blends in pretty well. Um, and I think that's like my one issue with this is that it might not read to the viewer as ceramics, um, or at least to viewers who aren't familiar with ceramic surfaces, it might not read. Um, but I really wanted to, in this case, use that mic mesh as a symbol much rather than a functional device. And again, um, with the mic mesh also, what interested me is that it at the same time kind of looks like a speaker, um, which is the same with an actual mic mesh, but um, I, liked, I liked the kind of translation um, into, into that shiny surface. And I, I was hoping that it would actually call more attention um, to that surface. And I think for some viewers it does, and for others it, it just doesn't, which I guess is always the case with art making. I, 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 I'm off screen, but can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the drain also. I mean, I was thinking about Crumb's point about the functionality. And I was, the first thing I thought of, because um, I saw the show, was Robert Gober, and there's a kind of homage or something like that to to Gober um, with that drain. Yeah. 
Um, but I was also thinking a little bit about the choice of limestone as the, the base, because most of the other work in the show, um, you're using this kind of uh, sort of polished or otherwise very metallic um, elements, which have a kind of, uh, they, they have a kind of clinical quality, I guess you could say, in the sense that they look like things that might be used for tools in a, in a, I don't know, a kind of medical environment. But they're also things that clean up very, very quickly. Um, you know, you wipe down, blah, blah, blah. And I was wondering, given the, the kind of narrative implications of the, the drain piece, why you use limestone, which I'm assuming would absorb color, you know, if you have this kind of, uh, you know, sort of gothic blood-like uh, dripping thing, as opposed to a kind of metal base, which most of your other, um, there's, I know there's the, there's the marble for the. Yeah. Wow. I'm so impressed by this question. I feel like you're really in my head. Because that's yeah, really, so you know, what are you thinking? That's what I'm asking. It's like, why the limestone? How did the limestone? Yeah, I think it's really great. Um, you know, I I was thinking the same. So basically, the, I'm like fully revealing myself now. I had ordered a different stone that polishes um, much, to a much higher degree, and um, then there was a like a COVID shipping issue, and I got limestone instead, and. I thought it would polish to the same degree. Um, and you know, arguably, I think, I think it looks more absorbent than it is. I think that actually if you poured liquid onto it, it would not um, absorb. Maybe it would stain though. And that's a really good point because cl clinicality is important in my work. But yeah, I think, um, I would probably, if I got the piece back and could still work on it, I would probably apply some kind of sealant that makes it look higher polished. But I, it's, it's, it's really great that you, that you got into my head to this degree. Well, it is, it's an unusual, I mean, relative to all the other materials you're using, it's, um, it stands out a bit. I was thinking also it has a kind of, it's, it's a soft stone which has a kind of mm -hmm. flesh-like quality, at least relative to- Did you say flesh-like? Flesh yeah, like flesh-like, it has a kind of soft- Yeah, quality. I mean, one thing that I liked about that is that um, the sculpture, I think, looks, I'm not saying neat as like a self-complement, but neat in terms of order. I think it looks quite neat, and at the same time, there is an implication of such a mess. And I think that is what I liked about the limestone, is that, there is this, you know, fleshiness about the color. And even with that risk of, of staining and absorbing color, it, it somehow, I think, hints at a potential mess. And that's what I, I was curious about in that version. I actually have one quick question too about the new piece, um, or the new piece is the bowing piece. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about the, um, the is it, uh, what is the material that's the kind of metal material? Is it, is it um, like it's, it, I don't know, it's like, a, it's not this kind of shiny reflective material. Yeah, I wonder, it's, it's bronze really actually, but it's, it's finished, okay. it's finished in the same way. So it's finished with the same, um, basically the same scotch white or sandpaper count. Um, like this thing. Can you say thing. a bit more about that? Because you also have this, um, well, yeah, just uh, yeah. Kind of so transition to using bronze. Like. Yeah, I, I can say more about that. Um, I'm currently working on like a suite of new works, which is often actually how I work, that I, I love to think of, you know, the works that I put out there are almost like musical albums, kind of concept albums that follow one certain tone. and the tone with this suite that I'm working on, I'm, um, it's all about the relationship with the self. Um, and I am intentionally making reference to um, sacred spaces. So um, the bases will actually be also out of stone, but will have um, like a tile pattern that um, references different chapels and cathedrals 
And I thought about metal elements and, um, you know, what, what kind of metal occurs in different spiritual or religious or, you know, I should say just in different places of worship. And often that is brass or bronze. And um, yeah, for this, for this work, it made the most sense to work with bronze. Thank you. Could you unpack a remark you made uh, saying that uh, the uh, clinicality was, is, is important to your work? Um, it seems that, I mean, there's, in many works, it's not just depicting a relation between people. It's sort of um, showing a relation between people mediated by institutional power somehow. Like there's something that uh, put these uh, devices in place to make uh, sort of discipline people to behave a certain way. Yeah. And I'm kind of looking at this, um, this fellow, uh, uh, Paul Schraber, uh, who was like a, a subject of Freud, whose father had a device called the upright holder, Garada halter, that made him sit, sit up straight at the uh, dinner table. It looked very much like this device here, here as well. Um, but basically, he had his ideas about child rearing and made all his children, um, you know, have, wear these devices. And uh, Paul Schraber was the famous um, Schraber case where um, Freud developed the theory of paranoia based, based on his writing. But yeah, I mean, could you talk about the clinical and institutional power that might be embodied in these apparatuses? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm just taking a note here. Can, the first name is Paul Schreiber. Uh, Daniel Paul Schreiber, who is... Um, Daniel Paul. That, that yeah. sounds really great, that reference about the upright holder, it's called. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to look that up. So it was uh, more, more Schreiber. Schreiber mm -hmm. Gardens are named for him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think just spontaneously, I wouldn't say that the clinical and the institutional are related. Um, you know, I think the the clinical really, um, well, I would have to unpack it more. <laughs> I think there there is a clinical aspect of just surfaces, what um, whoever was speaking before you, I'm sorry that I can't see anyone and don't know your names yet, but um, the clinical aspect um, is, very apparent in the surfaces, meaning, you know, they can be wiped clean um, easily and free of any residue. Um, and the institutional for me really came in um, with works like Negotiator and Mediator, um, which is why I chose also Stone Base a stone base for negotiator. And there's actually a mediator version that also comes with a polished black granite um, base, which, you know, those bases are kind of inspired by um, institutional lobbies and, and entry halls. Um, and I'm still trying in my head to pull it together what you could be getting at STEM. Um, Yeah, I think, you know, if I just go, sorry, I'm making you dizzy again. <laughs> um, yeah, let's go back to negotiator. Um, there is something very institutional about this in the sense that it only works in a very particular way. And the participants have to completely submit to that one way it operates. Otherwise, you can't even have a seat at the table. You know, like you have to stand on that one side and um, it's actually hard to see maybe in this shot, but for those who are familiar with skateboards or snowboards or anything that's a board or surfboards, um, there is this um, arrangement of either your goofy, meaning your right foot is forward or your regular and your left foot is forward. And um, in this sculpture, I kind of chose the imagined participants to be goofy. So they're standing with their right foot forward, left foot on, in the back. And it's just really particular in that way that kind of reminds me of um, any administrative processes in institutions. It's like, well, you can achieve this thing, but you got to go through all of these little loopholes and you got to do it that certain way. So um, 
I think that's an institutional aspect. Um, but, you know, even the title negotiator or mediator are thing, I, those are interactions that, you know, can happen intimately, but definitely on a very institutional level as well. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the submitting to the apparatus functioning in a very particular predetermined way is what is so institutional about them. But Stan, I'm curious, can you tell me what you have in mind about the clinical and how that relates? I guess more about sort of institutional power uh, and disciplining bodies. I mean, it kind of gets to the Foucaultian idea about um, um, uh, biopower, of bodies being um, sort of disciplined and organized by the state. Um, yeah. which seems to the implication in, in, in some of these pieces where it's um, making b bodies behave a certain way. You, ca you can't negotiate freely. You can't do and have an arm wrestle. You need to have this uh, device in between you and your uh, antagonist uh, in order for it to be uh, validated by whatever institutional power is putting this uh, in, in between the two of you. So it right. seems like you're trying to make a, making physical uh, institutional power. Yeah, that's why I'm so interested in, you know, the aspect of embodiment in, in dance and movement, because I think um, often in dance and movement, you know, these concepts are translated so well, um, physically. Yeah. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the video that we watched. It's it's so mesmerizing, almost in the way that the video of the fingers is. And sort may of, I ask which one you're referring to? The the one that was uh, circulated for students ahead of time. Oh yes, yes, the um, storyboard P. Yes. Yeah. And, so those movements are sort of unusual and mesmerizing. And incredible. They're yeah, just, and it's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, so it, it's a song um, by Toy Face, a, a British singer. And, um, you know, I don't know how the video was made, if he actually improvised or not, but what is really apparent, and you can kind of go back and, and see it, is that he's always slightly behind the lyrics. Um, and there is one moment when she sings, um, do you believe in freedom? Uh, what is the Do you believe in freedom? Does it... Oh yeah, d d does it call your name or something like that? And he embodies freedom, but he, again, he's totally like behind the lyrics, like two seconds or something, which is why I think it might be improvised. And he just translates freedom into this weird fall into the wall, that hallway kind of leaning over in this way where it just looks like he magically overcomes gravity. Oh yeah, do you believe in freedom? Is it calling your name? That's the lyric. Um, and I am inspired by um, two things about, about that video. One is um, embodiment, how, how Storyboard P embodies lyrics and words and experiences and concepts that, you know, language can so easily communicate. He communicates that completely non-verbally which is just fascinating and leads to these incredible movements. And the other thing that I just adore about the video actually re relates to the text, um, the choreography as apparatus of capture. There is one part in the text, um, maybe I can quickly find it and read it out. Um, Maybe. Oh my God, here it is. Okay. Dance, once it falls prey to a powerful apparatus of capture called choreography, loses many of its possibilities of becoming, which is to say that dance loses its powers and it is submitted to the power 
of the, choreo of the choreographic. So loses many of its possibilities of becoming. That is the core of um, what I'm so interested in in this video because his movements are, they seem to constantly be at the moment of becoming, meaning they could lead into one or the other. One doesn't know, it's very kind of unpredictable where it goes and um, it's almost like we're not just witnessing the art, but the art making process all at once. Thank you. You mentioned you mentioned that sometimes people may not read um, the microphone as ceramic. I know. Is it, in, is it intentional that you don't want people to read uh, ceramic as ceramic? Because I love how you mix the materials, and ceramics very like subtle. It's a subtlety for me in a way. Subtlety, yes. Thank you, kindly. Um, you know, I appreciate it when, when it's subtle. I think disappointment is a big word, but do I want viewers to know that it's ceramics? Yes. Um, you know, but is it okay to discover that at third glance? Absolutely. Is it okay to learn that in a lecture after having seen the piece also totally fine, but I'm not hiding the fact. It's not a, it's not a trompe l'oeil. I don't want the material to read as something else. Um, yeah, Is, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um Um, these works were made across a multi-year period. How did you feel about them when they were all combined in this show? Did anything change? You know, I was quite struck by how well they related to one another, even, even preparing this talk. It was like, oh, nice, and now I can talk about this, and that leads into that. So, um, that, that was kind of a pleasant experience um, and made me think about exhibition making in a maybe less tight way. I, you know, as I said, often I think about the bodies of work that I put out as these albums and they have to come out, you know, several songs at once and be seen together. And I think it's still my preferred way of working, but this was kind of, an experience, um, experiment to, you know, try, try and approach it like a compilation. Um, very much inspired again by the Between Love and Loss uh, compilation. And um, I think, you know, ideally the work, <laughs> sounds weird, but the works can almost like learn from each other. Um, yeah, that, that was my experience. I, I would probably do it again. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Julia. And, uh... Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure, and I wish I could have been there in person. Okay. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs> See you.